Hey friends, welcome to Ivy's Fortress. I'm Ashanta, your reading friend, and we have a book for Black-Eyed Susan, written by Judy Young, illustrated by Doris Etlinger. Hmm, Tales of Young American series. This is a great historical fiction book. It has a really honest historical piece about it when travelers, pilgrims were moving and transitioning into the west coast taking the oregon trail or reaching california there were a lot of unique stories that happened during these times in regards to keeping families together and them separating so although this is a fictional character this is something that really kind of did happen in the transition to the west coast by our previous american citizens our ancestors and travelers from the past so before we get reading Let's sing our friend's song. So get your friend's fingers ready. All right. One, two, three, go. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. I'm glad that you are here with us. I'm happy that you're near. Come along for our adventure. It'll bring you lots of cheer. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. Hey there, friends. Hey there, friends. Welcome to Ivy's Fortress. All right, let's get reading because this is a hefty one. But I want you to really keep in mind what you would do in these situations if you were a little girl or a little boy during these times. We didn't have cell phones and tablets and we were traveling back to back, seat to seat in carriages across the country, which are led by horses or mules. So let's read our inside cover with our new reading glasses. Put them on. There we are. All right. A book for Black Eyed Susan. When 10 year old Cora and her family leave their home in Missouri, their hearts are filled with the hopes and dreams of a bright future gleaming with promise and opportunity. But the journey west by wagon train is harsh and tragedy strikes swiftly and unexpectedly. Now Cora and her father must steal themselves for a different future from what they had carefully planned. How can they move forward when their hearts are broken? But move on they must, and they are many miles to travel before they reach their new home. And seeking solace for her loss, Cora looks to the past to help craft a line, a link to a new life. And in doing so, she finds reserves of strength and renewed sense of meaning and purpose to help face the challenges ahead. Against the backdrop of the Oregon Trail unfolds a story of perseverance and enduring family love. Now, I want to read this note about the author, uh, the author's note because it gives us a direct relationship to the historical context of this book. So, without further ado, here is our author's note by Judy Young. Traveling on the Oregon Trail was not easy for the pioneers. There were many physical hardships, but there were emotional hardships as well. One that almost everyone faced was separation. From their first steps west, the pioneers were separated from loved ones that stayed behind. Along the way, death also separated families and friends. Approximately one in 17 died during the journey from illness, accidents, or in childbirth. Many children lost one parent, some both. It was up to other family members, friends, or even strangers to take care of surviving children, and sometimes siblings were divided among several families. Near South Pass, in what is currently southwestern Wyoming, the trail divided, separating those who traveled together for more than 900 miles. Some took the California Trail with dreams of finding gold in that new state. Others continued traveling on the Oregon Trail toward the good farmland in Oregon Territory. Once reaching Oregon Territory, education was a high priority and schools were quickly opened in the new communities. Teachers on the frontier were often young women who passed the tests made by local school boards. 
One famous frontier teacher was author Laura Ingalls Wilder. Although Wilder never traveled down the Oregon Trail, she taught at a frontier school in Dakota Territory at age 15. When writing historical fiction, research is used to support imagination, so all that happens in the story could have happened, even if it didn't in reality. In a book for Black-Eyed Susan, Cora and her family are entirely fictitious, but the events that happened to them were all possible. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about, and this is the reader note, but one of my favorite parts about historical fiction is the ability to use imagination to give people a good idea or good visual what was happening in the past that can give them a perspective that either changes their life for the better or it allows them to make better choices with good knowledge and, and quality information. So without me rambling on, let's read our book. It was still dark when Cora awoke. She looked across the prairie and saw her family's wagon glowing with lantern light. Yesterday, Pa pulled their wagon away from where the others circled for the night, but told 10-year-old Cora to stay with Uncle Lee. Cora ran through the tall grasses until she reached her wagon. Aunt Alma was inside holding a baby. Pa sat leaning against the wagon wheel, her, his, head, his head in his hands. Something was wrong. Where's Ma? Cora could barely squeak out the words. When Pa lifted his head, the lantern light fell across his face. Tears rolled down his cheeks. All he could do was shake his head and pull Cora tight to his chest. When the sun lightened the sky, Cora and Pa stood side by side on a small hill. The others had already left the gravesite to get ready to move on. What about the baby, Cora asked. Aunt Alma can take care of her, said Pa. It was soon time to leave. Cora sat in the back of their wagon. Through her tears, she watched the wooden cross on the hill become smaller and smaller until it disappeared. Then she lay down and cried herself to sleep. The wagon bumped and jiggled across the prairie. Cora awoke when she felt its movement stop at noon. She climbed out and walked slowly to Aunt Alma's and Uncle Lee's wagon. Do you want to hold her? Aunt Alma asked. Cora sat down and Aunt Alma placed the baby in her arms. As Cora softly stroked the tassel of yellow hair on her sister's head, the baby opened her eyes. They were pitch black. That evening, Pa and Cora sat in front of the fire. They could hear Aunt Alma singing quietly to the baby. Pa, Cora asked, I have a good name for the baby. What, Pa asked. Susan, Cora said. She reminds me of black-eyed Susans. That's a beautiful name, Pa said. Your Ma would like that too. They were Ma's favorite flowers, said Cora remembering how she picked handfuls along the trail for her mother. The days rolled on just as the wagon train did. Cora helped Aunt Alma with Susan as much as possible. But one stormy day, Cora sat alone in her own wagon. As rain pelted on the canvas, she built, pulled out her mother's sewing box. Thumbing through the scraps, there were many pieces she recognized. A piece from her grandma's apron, one from grandpa's shirt, and another from Ma's favorite dress. Cora thought of the house they had left in Missouri. Grandma thought of the house they had left in Missouri. Grandma on the porch, grandpa leading the mules to the barn. She thought about Ma. Susan would never know any of them. She wouldn't even remember the trip to Oregon. Suddenly, Cora had an idea. Cora took the scissors and cut squares, triangles, and rectangles from the scraps. She arranged the shapes on the largest square, threaded the needle, and started sewing. 
When she was done, she held up the square and smiled. Remember, the farm has back in Missouri. Across the prairie, Cora worked on different squares. One had a covered wagon, another a campfire with a cooking spider. Some had pictures of animals Cora saw along the way. Prairie dogs peeking from their holes, buffalo, a coyote hawk. There was a square with a strangely shaped cliff called Chimney Rock, another showing a wagon crossing a river, and then mountains rising blue in the distance. One evening, Pa came to Cora. His face was sad, his eyes tired. He put his arm around Cora and without talking, they walked away from the wagons. At last, Pa broke the silence. I've asked Aunt Alma and Uncle Lee to raise Susan, he said. No, Cora stopped, turning to face her father. I can take care of her. You're too young, Pa said, and a baby needs a mother. But they're going to California, Cora argued. We'll never see her again. Yes, I know. We've gone through South Pass and tomorrow the train will divide up, Pa said. He sighed and shook his head. This isn't the way I want things to be, Cora, but it will be the best for Susan. Cora turned and ran as hard as she could, away from Pa, away from the wagons, away from the baby. Finally exhausted, she dropped into the grasses and steered back east toward her home a thousand miles away. Cora knew deep down Paul was trying to do what was best. Aunt Alma was already being a good mother to Susan, but Cora didn't know if she could stand watching them leave with Susan tomorrow. Suddenly, she jumped up. Tomorrow, she said. I've only got till tomorrow. Cora raced back to the wagon and grabbed the sewing box. She carefully embroidered a square until it was dotted with black-eyed Susans. Then she took all the other squares she had made and stitched them together. She smiled as she leafed through them. It would be Susan's first book. The next morning, Cora rushed to Aunt Alma's wagon. Susan was sleeping. Cora gave her a goodbye kiss on the forehead and turned to Aunt Alma. She wanted to tell Aunt Alma about the books, but all she could do was push the cloth page into her aunt's hands. Aunt Alma looked at each page and then wrapped her arms around Cora. I promise when Susan gets older, I'll give her this book and tell her the story about how she crossed the prairie. Aunt Alma said, and that she has a sister named Cora who loves her very much. Yo, chill out, my dog. The wagon train divided. Cora and Pa moved on, crossing the high plains desert, then into the mountains, and weeks later, finally reaching Oregon territory. Soon, Pa had built a home and then a farm. A town grew up and a school was built. Months passed into years. Cora did well in her studies, and six years after she left Missouri, she took a test to become a teacher. It wasn't long before she was offered a position. A minister and his wife would journey south to open a new church, and she would go with them to teach school. We have a few slates, but no books, the minister said, as he showed Cora the schoolhouse. We've asked the students to bring any they have from home. I brought my old readers, Cora replied, setting them on the desk beside the slate. She also pulled out a ledger, a bottle of ink, and a pen. When the children arrived, she asked them to line up in front of her desk. What's your name? Cora asked the first child. She carefully dipped her pen and wrote his name in her ledger. She did the same with two more boys. The next child stood in front of her desk. And your name, Cora asked, looking up from the ledger. My name is Susan, 
And I have a book. Aww. So this book is the book Cora made for her sister Susan when she was a baby, before they split on the trail. The end. That was, that was a heart warmer right there. It's good to know that we had ancestors in our country that in the United States of America that persevered through a lot of separation that happened during that time. I couldn't imagine losing my mom while traveling across the country. And I honestly couldn't imagine my life without technology and half of the ways we transport nowadays. Um, so it is very heartwarming and it gives me a good feeling about knowing that perseverance was a character characteristics amongst a lot of families and children at this time because I can only imagine how difficult it is to travel across the country. Nope, nope, you're gonna knock the tripod over. Well, let's read a little bit about our author and illustrator. You see a doggy nose on the screen? Judy Young. Judy Young is an award-winning author of children's fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, including Minnow and Rose, The Lucky Star, and our see what I mean, is for rhyme, a poetry alphabet, an avid hiker, Judy once walked 1,400 miles of the Appalachian Trail, almost three quarters the length of the Oregon Trail. Judy also enjoys treks to speak at schools and educational conferences nationwide. Visit Judy at www.judyyoungpoetry.com. Doris Ed 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 Etlinger. Etlinger. Doris Etlinger has illustrated many books for children, including the award-winning The Orange Shoes. She graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design and University of Wisconsin-Madison. Doris lives with her husband in an old grits mill in western New Jersey, where they raised their children. Now they share the house with a little black dog. When her son left home to make his way into the world, he took his music equipment, a laptop, and an old patchwork quilt repaired over the years with scraps of fabric from his family's clothes. While illustrating a book for Black Eyed Susan, Doris thought about the meaning we attach to homemade and much used objects and how they help us stay connected with our family and history. See more of Doris's work at www.dorisatlinger.com. And this is a Sleeping Press published book. Well, I'm so glad I could share this one with you. I hope you can continue to read and reread. Check this out from your local library or buy it at your bookstore near you. And I'll catch you guys next time for another good read. Bye.